Hi everyone, and welcome to the Any Monday Podcast. My name is Colin Hemphill. And I'm Kayla Hemphill. On our show, we roll the virtual dice each week and must watch a randomly selected anime title. Thanks for joining us. Happy 2019! We're glad to be back. It's been a little while since our Christmas special, and uh, we're back for the new year. Yeah, it's exciting. Well, the last time uh, we had a normal episode, we hit the random button on Crunchyroll, and the show that we rolled is called Broken Blade. Broken Blade was a manga series that started in 2006, and then there was a series of six anime films that premiered in 2010, and uh, we watched the first two of those since they're about 50 minutes each. There was also apparently a 12-episode short-form series that happened in 2014. That one in particular I don't think is on Crunchyroll. Kayla, would you like to give us a synopsis? Sure thing. The kingdom of Krishna discovers an ancient mech deep underground, but the magic they normally use to operate these machines don't seem to have any effect on it. In order to utilize this great weapon in their war against the Athens Commonwealth, the king turns to the aid of Rygar Arrow, an unusual young man who cannot use magic. Well, we had a very brief break, and we're back to mech. (laughs) 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 Did we even have a... I guess ZX Ignition wasn't technically a mech show. Yeah, not really. It kind of felt like one sometimes. Sometimes. But we've had a lot of mecha anime recently. (laughs) So much mech. Which was to be expected, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But uh, it seems like Crunchyroll has it out for us. It does. So as I uh, mentioned in the background, this is more of a long-form anime. Uh, It's more kind of like hour-long episodes, and they call them films, but they're episodes. Yeah, definitely. It's a six-part series. How how do you think that felt, like, just overall, since this is pretty different than the other shows that we've watched that have been all 20-minute kind of shows? It it definitely felt different because it was hard. I, I can't imagine, like, where to split that up into, like, 20 minute segments. Um, so I felt like it, it worked for the show to have, to have it in a 50 minute kind of block. Yeah. And especially since it's only six of these, um, it doesn't seem like it's impenetrable either. It's not like this super long thing you're having to invest in and, and watch in huge blocks as well. So that's nice. Yeah. Well, uh, I think it kind of makes sense here to jump in and talk about the characters in the show. Really, the the main character that we see in the show is Rygert, and it seems like from some of the background information we got on him that he and his family were all farmers. They seem to be just kind of normal people. And uh, in fact, to the point that they even talked about how he had to drop out of school at one point because they couldn't afford to keep keep going. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of a, a different background than we've seen in a lot of anime. Um Especially, like, as a reason to leave school, I don't think that's something I've I've really seen before. No, I don't think they emphasize just how expensive school can be. Um, something we haven't really talked about is that, especially for things like high school, it's not just assumed you'll go to your local high school. You actually have to apply and pay to go to many of the different academies that they have there. Especially in this case, um, I think they were all part of a, a military academy specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, so surely there were some special requirements in terms of tuition. But yeah, I, th- I think it's it's interesting that we have this kind of character who comes from a poor background because we very commonly see the rich kid in anime, mm-hmm. but it rarely goes the other way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, anything about Rygert you, um, you noticed or want to talk about? Uh, There is one thing in particular that kind of struck me about this character. Something I was kind of thinking about that uh, I kind of have to give some background. This world is inhabited by people who have magic, or at least something they call magic. That is their name for it. (laughs) Yeah, that's their name for it. Um, But Rygar does not. And it's apparently like a genetic thing. They pass it from parent to child. And he and his little brother both do not exhibit any ability to wield magic. And so he really struggles in life because of it. He's bullied a lot. He can't use normal day-to-day 
sort of equipment because it's all powered by magic. And as I was kind of thinking about it, if if you really want to think about it, is he could be really like a placeholder for disabled people living in an able-bodied world as somebody who can't operate the same way that everyone just assumes that you should be able to operate and then is treated poorly for not being able to do something that people are just born able to do and he wasn't. Yeah, um, like how you mentioned that normal things that they would use every day are powered by um, this type of magic. And and that magic specifically is like they, they're, they're all able to manipulate quartz and they can use that in various ways by like moving it and shaping it and they're able to power large devices because of that. Um, but in this case, even like his family being farmers, all of their tools, a simple, simple tool for farming is expected to be powered by quartz. And so the the output and the efficiency of that farm is greatly decreased if he can't use those tools. Which is something that they talk about because his dad, in order to enable him in life and teach him that he can still survive, gets rid of all of those equipment that he had before and buys, you know... Traditional farming equipment. Yeah, and teaches Mm -hmm. him how to farm the land without using magic so that he can survive. Um, And that's something people comment on is how could an unsorcerer survive for so long? And it seems to me that, you know, if they enabled people, which they do in the show, if they find a way to enable these people to function, that they would actually thrive. Yeah. And I'm not 100% clear on the commonality of this instance. Uh, It seems to be extremely rare. Mm -hmm. It's less like My Hero where it's, you know, a small percentage, but there's still a lot of people who don't have the abilities. This seems to be more like the one in a million kind of case. Yeah, definitely. People kept going up to him and saying, I've never met an an unsorcerer before. Yeah. Uh, So right as we start with the story, we meet Rygert, and he is approaching what appears to be a palace of some sort. Um, And pretty much right from the start of the show, we meet King Hoder. And this guy is awesome uh, for two reasons, largely. (laughs) And these are dumb reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one, he rides in a Pope Mobile, (laughs) uh, like almost literally. Mm -hmm. Number two, he has a sweet owl Mm -hmm. that rides around on his shoulder. Yeah, it's really cute. Its name is Graham. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned those two things because that's pretty much all that I liked about him. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, to me, it seemed like he didn't really have much of a personality. And that could be because we haven't really gotten exposed to it yet. But those are the only two things <laughs> standing out about him. Yeah, I mean, he seems um, he's very cool headed like he he never gets worked up in the show uh to the point of being like you know maybe you should kind of freak out at this a little bit uh because they're in the middle of a war Mm -hmm. and some crazy things are happening and and he seems to not really react in any particular way yeah uh in fact one of the strangest things about him is that he is uh married to this girl named sigan who was also one of their friends back at the the military academy and She is clearly not into him, and he's clearly not into her. They don't even seem to, like, stay in the same place, and she is shown, like, choosing to not wear her her wedding ring at one point. Uh, But she is obviously into the main character, of course. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I actually found it interesting that there is only one scene that, that we have watched so far that they are even in the same room together. And in it, if if the cast did not tell us that those two characters were married, Yeah, then we wouldn't know it at all, um, other than the one scene later on with her in the, the wedding ring. Yeah, it's even like, we know that she's the queen. Mm-hmm. They, they talk about her being royalty at certain points, and we know that he's the king. I don't even remember a specific time that they were like, oh yeah, those two are married. Only once when she goes up to Rygart. And is like, why did you miss our wedding? Yeah. That was literally it. (laughs) Um, There is one frustrating thing about this character that I did not enjoy, which is I was really hoping they wouldn't turn her into a sex object. 
And they kind of did. Um, so far only in one scene, which is good. Uh, for the most part, you know, she's clothed and everything. She kind of wears this, like, robe the, thing. They're popes. I'm, yeah. I, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> they look like popes. Everybody wears robes with, like, these pointy hats. It's it's strange. And um, there's this scene where they show her, like, waking up in her bedroom, which is separate from her husband's. And she has all these books scattered all over her bed because she's, like, crazy about research. And, you know, she's in sleep attire, but she's sleeping in this weird position that nobody sleeps in. And, you know, she's mostly naked. And it just spends a lot of time following, like, when she wakes up, following her around in this half-dressed state. And I just have a feeling that that's not going to necessarily go away. But for the most part, you know, they, they do try to emphasize that she is brilliant. But a lot of people dismiss her. Like a lot of men who have authority in the show dismiss her authority and her brilliance. And that's such a shame because I really would have loved to see, you know, people embrace their queen and how brilliant she is. Yeah, and that could be partly that... She doesn't seem to have any interest in the role either. In fact, like I, at least from the information that we have so far, I don't really know why she's queen or why she chose to marry this guy. Aside from, I guess, it's a cool position. Yeah, it seems like her affection lies with the main character. But for some reason, she ended up marrying one of his best friends. Yeah, and I mean, there's there's some political stuff underlying and it's probably some political marriage. Probably. Uh, but I guess we'd have to see later. Yeah. One guy that's worth mentioning uh, who doesn't appear to be important, but he's cool, is uh, General Balder. Uh, <laughs> and I mention him only because he has uh, sweet future man cyber glasses, uh, <laughs> which makes for a very weird kind of mix of styles in this show. It's, uh, I mean, he looks like he's straight out of some cyberpunk kind of thing. Oh, yeah, definitely. And the rest of them look like almost Mediterranean or Middle Eastern kind of look yeah. to uh, it's a very desert sort of uh, environment that they're in. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. He, <laughs> he was just a weird character that I thought was cool. Uh, they have one other childhood friend. So there's four of them total. But one of them is working for their enemy in Athens, um, and that's Zess. And this is actually my favorite character. Yeah. Uh, I found him really compelling. Uh, I thought his history was really interesting. He seems to have, without us knowing really the reason why, he seems to have the most interesting reason for joining this war. He went to a military academy uh, to try and take down his brother, who I guess is in the military in Athens, and then somehow, for reasons unbeknownst to us, he joins his brother to fight this war. Um, we also find out that he's married with a kid that we don't know anything about. And so, to me, this character is really interesting because they have really great motivations that some of which I don't even know about yet. And it just seems like I could really latch on to this one. Yeah, and his connection with the other people that we've already talked about Hoder and Rygart and Sigyn makes for really interesting dynamics while they're actually in the process of fighting the war. And uh, I think that's something we're going to continue to see through this show is that their dynamics make it really hard for him to keep fighting. And so a lot of the show, I think, is going to be him trying to unpack those motivations. Yeah. And, it, and there's so much going on in this story, too, about misinformation and what all the characters do and do not know about each other. And so it's interesting to watch them when they do interact and to see those things of like, oh, wait, wait, hold on. No, you're missing something, but it's too late. You know, they're already gone. Um, and this character seems to kind of be around the center of that. Yeah, and speaking kind of specifically about the war itself, uh, they, they shared a little bit of information about what's actually going on and why they're fighting. The king at one point is talking to the main character, Rygert, about how they've tried to settle the war. They've tried to end it. They've tried to bring peace back. 
Uh, and in fact, he he wants to end the war. He wants to to basically uh, sign a truce and and surrender to them. But in doing so, not only will they turn over all of their land to Athens. Um, they're also going to, under the table, kill off all the nobility of their kingdom. Uh, and I think the the whole war itself is kind of a gray thing that we don't really understand fully. Obviously, they're portraying Athens as like the bad guys because the main characters are all part of the other side. But it really seems like they just kind of want to subdue Krishna because they have all the cool resources. Uh, I actually kind of disagree about the story showing both good and bad guys because um, there's this part where they reveal that Krishna has actually been allowing a different country to travel through their lands in order to attack a neighboring country, which is causing problems for Athens. And that's part of the reason why Athens is attacking is because they're like, hey, you're actually like instigating some of this by, you know, pretending to be passive or pretending to be neutral, you're actually allowing this war to take place. And that to me is very realistic. Like, I feel like that's something that we see a lot in our own world with wars that go on is kind of these underhanded deals and people saying they're neutral and they're not neutral and people going after resources. Like, that's why we fight a lot of wars is because Somebody doesn't have the resources they want, and another country does. Um, and I actually really liked the story because of that, because it had this really real sense of war behind it, with not really either one being good or bad, but fighting for the thing that they want most. Uh, do we want to talk at all about the the mechs and how those work? Uh, sure. Yeah, so in this show, they're called golems. And I think that's actually kind of a fitting name for these, because... More in like a a fantasy RPG kind of sense. These are, they are mechanical creatures that they have built. Their constructions, um, but they're not technology. They're not anything like that. They are powered by the magic that they use, which is a natural resource and a natural kind of thing that they're born with. And uh, one of, one of the big plot points that you touched on um, at the beginning was that. They uncover this golem that is buried under the city and is built by who they call the ancients, which obviously is like more our time probably, um, but we're not entirely sure about that. And uh, none of the people there can get this this golem to activate. Their normal magic that they would use to, to pilot these things doesn't work. And so that's why they call Rygert in as one of the few people who... who can't use magic normally. And of course, as soon as he steps into this thing, it works immediately. Yeah, he's definitely set up in this very common trope that we see a lot in mech shows, um, being kind of the one true pilot. That said, at least they don't fall into the trap of him being instantly good at it. We spend most of these two episodes with him fumbling around, barely able to like take a step. Yeah, that's true. Well, uh, anything else specific on the story or the characters that you want to talk about? Uh, one of the things that I wanted to say about Rygar is that he kind of reminds me of Sinji from Evangelion. Um, and that he is really resistant towards being a part of this. Um multiple times that he's approached about being a part of the war or even just being aware of it, he immediately goes to bail. He's just like, thanks for the news. I'm going to go take my brother and we're going to leave before this turns terrible and we lose our lives. But unlike Sinji, I feel like he approaches it with more maturity of an adult rather than how Sinji being like 14 handles it. Um, he still has this inner conflict, and he's bothered by the things that he has to see and encounter. Um, at one point, he does get in his mech, and he witnesses somebody dying, and that stays with him. We see some of the scenes afterwards where he goes and visits that person's grave, and um, you can see how upset he is. And I think it'll be interesting to see how that develops as he continues to participate kind of against his own will. Yeah. And that specific case too was him making a move that 
him as an inexperienced person who basically dropped out of military school, like made a decision that got multiple people killed. Mm -hmm. uh, and at least one of those deaths could have been prevented. And so, and, and like you said, that at that point is pretty much towards the end of episode two, where he decides, I'm just going to go home. I like, I don't, I don't need to be here. Uh, even though I power the super weapon that will end this war. Uh, so, and, and obviously, like, he turns around and he decides to fight anyway. So I think it's pretty easy to see where that goes. But I think it would it could be interesting to see how he's able to handle those kinds of things. All right. I think we'll take a quick break and we'll be back to talk about the production and uh, wrap it up with our likes and dislikes. Right, and we're back. All right, Kayla, what did you think about uh, the animation quality, character designs, art, music, all that kind of stuff? I thought the show did something kind of unique uh, that we haven't really seen in a mech show. While not all the animation in the show was maybe as polished as some of the other shows that we've seen, it's really well done, especially when it came to the mech suits. Uh, something that we've talked about in other previous mech shows is the shortcut that some of the shows will do, uh, which is dump in some CG work in the middle of their hand-drawn style. And this show didn't really seem to do that. It seemed like everything was really seamless to the point where it is really hard to tell, like, if anything, you know, really changed at all in the style of the animation. This is probably something they have a big advantage with of being in a long form show that uh, is only a certain number of episodes long. This probably wouldn't have aired on TV. Uh, this might have been something you could buy on Blu-ray or you could stream it online. But I I'm not sure that they would have just played these sequentially, meaning they don't have the deadlines that a traditional aired show has. Uh, and, and the fact that they're films means that they can, you know, they, they might have crunch, they might have uh, certain deadlines they're trying to make, but they're able to push boundaries because they have the budget and they have more time. The animation studio for this, this show is Production IG, which uh, is pretty famous for a couple things, but uh, some that we would know are Psychopaths. Oh, yes. Uh, Fooly Cooly, mm. both the original and the remakes. Oh, nice. Or, not the remakes, but the new seasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, the end of Evangelion, the <laughs> film. <laughs> Ugh. It, it was going so well, so well. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, no matter what people say about the end of Ava and how, you know, it's it's a... Uh, bad. It's bad. <laughs> some people would say it's bad. Some people would say it's his big, like, you know screw you to all the fans who didn't like the original ending. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everyone agrees that the animation is beautiful in that movie. And it's and it shows here. Yeah. Uh, so I thought in addition to like the mech animation being uh, seamless, like you said, um, the environments are also pretty interesting. The action's good. The character designs are well animated. Um, these people looked pretty normal and despite their weird clothing, <laughs> <laughs> they were uh, they were pretty well done. I think in, in terms of character design specifically, I talked about the guy with the weird sci-fi glasses for no reason. <laughs> uh, there was also one other pilot I noticed who wore those like pince nez, you know, those real tiny, tiny glasses that sit in the center of your nose. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, what are you doing wearing those while you're driving a Mac? Those won't help. They could. You don't know. I don't think so. Those are not action glasses. I think those are for reading. Maybe he needs to read his screen inside of his mech. Mm -hmm. uh, you just mentioned the uh, background work, and that's something I'd love to touch on a little bit, is something we had talked about before is that the majority of the show takes place in a kind of desert area, which I think kind of lends its hand to the show in that... When when we see the mech battles, 
there isn't a whole lot of explosions and destruction and the big flash of stuff that happens in a lot of mech shows that again are kind of like shortcuts it makes the thing it makes the fights more exciting than they probably are because things are just exploding everywhere yeah. and this show does not have that at all they don't fight in any cities it's pretty much exclusively out in the desert where there's these huge rocky walls that are kind of enclosing them so really there's not a whole lot that you see in the background and it makes the fight so much more interesting in that you really see and feel every single thing um and you can see how well the animation is done because of that yeah and that kind of leads me to one of the things i think is really interesting about this show and I'll I'll put it kind of less in the production notes that I have um, and more in my general thoughts later. But to say on the point that, like, you don't see all those big explosions and things is that the fact that these are magic-powered robots makes them very different than the sci-fi robots that we normally see. Mm -hmm. Uh, That comes out in the animation, like you said, uh, but it also comes out in other ways, too. Um, yeah, and I just think it's very interesting that they feel so different than than most other mechs. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so that being said about the background, I do wish they had let us explore the world more because there's so little that we're seeing. Anytime that we are brought into the world of these people, we see so little of it. There's like four or five rooms that we've seen in total outside of the desert. And I just wish I could see more of this world. And that was kind of killing me because so for long sequences during these mech fights, it's just desert. And that's fine that we're looking at at mechs, but I really wish I could have gotten to see the kind of world that these people are trying to protect. And I just didn't get that. And that kind of bummed me out. Yeah, I think... Outside of, like, the scene where he visits a graveyard and we meet, like, the wife of that person, uh, we basically don't see anyone who's non-military. Uh, we don't see, like, town markets. We don't see homes or anything like that. Uh, we spend very little time outside of, like, the battlefield and the palaces. Mm-hmm. And even in the palace, it's, like, three rooms. Yeah, so maybe that'll change in further episodes, but... Uh, you're right that up front, it was very military focused. Mm-hmm. Do you want to talk about the music? I do. Uh, the opening and ending songs are not very good. <laughs> At least not that I not that I thought, especially. Oh, I I liked I liked the one for the first mm-hmm. episode. I did not like the one for the second. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I did note that the score was actually like exceptionally well done, especially. In one particular scene, I think it was pretty much the final scene of episode two. Um, both of us were actually thinking of it at the same time because you you made mention of the music there mm-hmm. uh, before it went into the bad ending song. <laughs> uh, the score there was actually like beautifully composed. Um, it really served to punctuate the scene in in just tremendous ways. It had a wonderful performance and just high quality recording. Uh, there was just this lovely theme just going in and out through the scene um, that really, really fit well. Yeah, this is something we don't really get to see very much in mech shows is they really took the time to get the feel of the characters and get the feel of what's happening rather than just like, here's some music that to listen to when you're kicking butt. You know, that's something we see a lot in mech shows and... This was very different because of that, and I don't know if it's because of the formatting of the show or what, but it was a good change of pace. Yeah. Might even drop in a a couple seconds of that ending clip that I'm talking about if if I remember to get around to it. (laughs) We'll see. (laughs)
悪いな親父じゃあ、okay. Would you、uh, like to close us out with some general thoughts, likes and dislikes, and that sort of thing? So, one thing we haven't talked about yet is that、um, I actually started watching this show a little separate than you.、Um, and I There is both the subtitles and the dubbed version of this show.、Um, and I tried watching both. And for me, that did not work. <laughs>、um, I was not partial to the cast in the dub. And、um, I was so so on the, on the voiceover work in the subtitled version. And I think that just made it hard for me to engage with the characters、um, because it just felt like. Their voices didn't really match up for me. And I, I just really had a hard time embracing them、uh, because there was something that just kind of struck a nerve with me, which was weird. <laughs> yeah, no, it happens. <laughs> I mean, dubs have a bad reputation for a reason sometimes. I, I, don't, I don't know about this one in particular. You only showed me a few seconds of it.、Uh, as soon as you started playing it, though, <laughs> to point out the main character, I was like, oh, that's Greg Aries. Uh, and I know that because I've like, spent time with him at, at our local con because he lives nearby.、Mm-hmm. And yeah, he's got, a, he's got an unusual voice and it fits in certain places. And I don't know about this one, but. He sounds like Doug Funny. He does a little bit, yeah. From, from the show, Doug. <laughs> and that,、uh, I, that image could not get out of my head the whole time I watched this. And I think that was just something that I had a hard time shaking.、Uh, but one other thing that. In, in line with kind of the voice acting, was also the way that these characters talked. The script for the show was written with a lot of sentence fragments.、Um, I think of one scene in particular where Rygar is like first learning to like try and move his suit. And、um, he keeps just speaking these short blip little sentences. And I just could not be more annoyed in that moment. He was just like, It moved when I hit the pedal. And you're like, okay, <laughs> come on.、Um, but that doesn't mean that they aren't saying important things and they aren't relating. And maybe in some ways it's more realistic to how people actually talk, but it, it just totally grated on me for some reason. Yeah, no, I, I can see that for sure.、Um, overall, I, th- I think I found it more engaging than you did.、Um, I like that it didn't stick to all the tropes that we typically see in these shows.、Um, it, it was really kind of just so different from other mecha anime <laughs> that we've seen so far that I, I, maybe that was what influenced me to like it a little bit more. While they haven't explored the environment as much as we would like them to,、um, I think overall what they were presenting was fairly interesting.、Uh, the politics actually weren't boring, which is especially difficult in mech shows where. Politics are so heavy in, in the plot that they just bog everything down, and then the rest is big action scenes, and nothing's actually happening. But in this one, it, it felt natural. It felt like the real world. And I think that helped、uh, move things along a little bit. Most of all, though, like the mechanics of, of the magic and the way that they use those in the mechs is kind of what interests me the most. In, in fact, kind of what I took away from it is that the fact that they're using this magic and they're relying on it so much is what makes their mechs so weak. When they find this other mech underground, it's substantially more powerful. It can jump higher, it can shoot faster, it can blow the other mechs out of the water. And you can see that in the animation, you can see it in the way the characters react. That when the, when the normal mechs are shooting, It feels a little more like a bow and arrow than a gun. You can, you can like feel the impact of their shots being like、um, the pull through of, of a, a bow being strung and then let loose. And you can see this in the fact that they have different types of ammunition that they use throughout the show. They have specific like armor piercing ones and they have anti personnel ones. And when, when they switch those projectiles, you can see it and you can feel it that these are slow. They don't really, they're not that effective. They're not going to like take down walls and buildings and stuff. These are mechs that are powered by magic, not by 
super technology. Uh, and I think that was that was really interesting to see. I also thought it was interesting that they did that with their sound design. Um, something I noticed before I realized it was about magic was that everything was substantially quieter than I thought it would be. Yeah. So you were talking about the general with the cyberpunk glasses. At one point, he comes up on the main character on like a motorcycle and it was so quiet. Yeah. It was like a, a hybrid motorcycle, you know. It, I thought it would be so much louder until I learned about the magic. And that's something we see all the time is it is. It's softer. It's softer. It's quieter. Everything about the magic enabled technology that they have is quieter. Yeah. And then when we have this suit, it is harder, it's louder, and it's it's stronger. Yeah. You see this too in things like one of the more inexperienced pilots gets up into the battlefield and is trying to shoot the enemy and they look like they are so close. They're they're like a couple hundred feet apart maybe. And in these kinds of shows, you're you're talking about mechs flying through space, shooting at things miles away, and the bullets just go forever. And uh, this person is like throwing a lob at the other one and just hoping that they can reach the target, not even like damage them, just hit them. So it's it's kind of cool how how weak they are because of their magic. Uh, but that's the only thing they've known and that they have access to. Uh, there were things about this show that weren't great. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the one scene with Sigin, uh, but there's another character that we haven't talked about, uh, and that is Cleo, uh, who they say is 12 years old, and I don't believe them. Nope. Not only do they make her look not 12, they make sure to tell you uh, all about her features mm -hmm. and the fact that she is 12. Yep. So that's not good. No. She was also, like, best friends with one of the people who died in the show. And uh, so I think she's going to be, like, a character who continues throughout the show. And I can see them making use of this character in certain ways that I'm not okay with. Yeah. Uh, so that that's one thing that I think is is troubling about it. And I'm, I'm not sure where it goes from here, but I don't know. One other thing that I do love, though is that one of the opposing countries is called Orlando. <laughs> it's the best. Yeah, all the other countries sound more like a country. <laughs> they just had to throw a jab at Florida. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Colin, would you watch more of this? Uh, this is going to get one of my coveted yeses, actually. <laughs> uh, I think it... Maybe it's partially that I had a more positive reaction because I was conditioned a little bit to expect bad mecha anime, like <laughs> this is what we've been seeing so much of. But I, I think I overall, maybe I went into it pretty neutral and came out feeling okay about it. And I think the fact that it's not so long, it's just like obviously the episodes are long, but there aren't dozens of them. This is something that I think I could finish the last four and then decide whether or not I want to, you know, feel positive about it or not. Um, I don't feel like I'm investing all that much to finish it out and just see what happens. Yeah, so uh, what do you think about? Would you watch more of this? My first instinct was to say no, but I think after talking with you, you have moved me into a maybe. Uh, I think I would watch it if you were watching it. If it were on, I would not leave the room. Mecha shows really aren't my jam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think I approached this show kind of already having one foot out the door. And then there were just a few little annoying things that just kind of ate away at me that I feel like I I just have a hard time embracing this show. Um, and that's okay. But um, yeah, I maybe. I don't think I'd go out of my way to go watch it, but I, I wouldn't turn it off if you had it on. All right. Well, I think that about does it for this week. If you want to learn more about our show, you can visit our website at anamonday.moe. That's anamonday.moe. You can send us questions or comments to podcast at anamonday.moe. And you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Our username is anamondaycast, and you can find links for that on our website. 
Thanks so much to Crunchyroll for all of the anime that you provide, and for the random button which produces these wonderful and wonderfully terrible results. If you want to follow along with us each week, we'll have a link to the current title on our website and social media, and uh, you can watch what we're watching. Thanks also to C2A for the intro and outro music that come from his Senpai EPs. You can find his music on Bandcamp and other major streaming services, and uh, we hope that you'll check him out. I'll have links to his music in the show notes and on our website. All right, are you ready to roll? I'm ready for the first roll of 2019. Woo-woo! All right, random button in three, two, one. All right, the anime for this week is Cromarty High School. (laughs) There's not a question mark in that. I just, I'm unsure. (laughs) (laughs) I can't. (laughs) Uh, and the first episode is called I Used to Be a Bad Boy Bragging Contest. All right. <laughs> what are we about to get into? It's, it doesn't have robots. It does not. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> oh, wait. There's a robot. Are, there's no <laughs> way. There's no way. This looks super weird. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wish us luck. <laughs> yep. All right, I think that'll do it for us. All right, we'll see you all next week. Yeah, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. I've forgotten everything about podcasting. No. <laughs> I don't want to start over. I'm sorry. I've forgotten everything. I don't know how to do this anymore. It's been too long. All right. I'll do it all by myself. Cool. Sounds great. King. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Annie Monday podcast. My name is Colin Hempill. And I'm Kayla Hempill. <laughs> On our show, we roll the virtual dice each week and must watch a randomly selected anime title. Thanks for being here. Colin's the best husband. (laughs) And the greatest podcaster in the whole world. Why do I sound like I'm 90? (laughs) Is that how you think I sound? I don't have a falsetto. I'm not going to try. Ah, that's fair. (laughs)